Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And joining me in the studio today are three of my pals here to talk about all things green and growing. So before we get started, let's have them quickly introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about where you can find them. So Jim, we'll start with you. Well, I'm an entomologist, retired entomologist from the Illinois Natural History Survey here on the campus of the Illinois Natural, of uh, the University of Illinois. And uh, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Okay, and we're gonna talk about some of those in a bit, okay? I'm Kay Carnes, I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and I um, love herbs, that's my kind of my specialty. Uh, I have my own garden, and I also volunteer at Allerton Park, uh, it run, overseeing their herb garden. Excellent. Wow. Yeah. Marty? And I'm Marty Alanya. Yeah, I just recently retired again. It's pretty great. Um, I'm none of the things that these people are. Jim is brilliant, and Kay is gifted, and they just need another warm body in a chair, so <laughs> here we are. So we called on you, right? Yeah, you get what you pay for on public television. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> and on that note, off we go. Okay, Jim, we're going to start with you, and you've got uh, a little story to share. Yeah, I, uh, about a month ago, I had a, a call from a lady who said that she loves to watch WILL TV in the evenings, which is we really love nice, that. which yeah. is really nice. Yeah. Her and her husband both like to do that, but she said, when I sit in my favorite chair, the armrest, which is wooden, is always very sticky. I mean, she said it was almost as if somebody spilled some uh, beverage on it. And I said, I bet you have a large tropical plant aside of your chair. And she said, oh yes, I do. I said, well, I bet anything that you got an infestation of soft brown scale on that Chef Lara. Wow. <laughs> so I thought that would be an introduction that we could talk about soft brown scale and uh, citrus mealybug, which are both pests of indoor plants. This slide shows a close-up of soft brown scale. You can see it's, uh, these are mature scales. So let's go to the next slide. Here's, here's a little far away shot, but you can see what they look like. They're rather small, and sometimes they're rather clear, so it's sometimes hard to find. Here's even closer up, and you can see the, the little yellow spots are the young ones, and they produce a huge number of young. Now, these scales, as well as mealybugs, produce a excretion called honeydew. That falls on the leaves, and that's what this shows on Chef Laris, a leaf with honeydew next. And then, if you don't wash that honeydew off, off on a black sooty fungus, grows on the honeydew, so it's a real problem. Here's a citrus mealybug. This was on Kalanko, and you can see how numerous they are. And here's another close-up, and you see all stages there, and some young ones, and uh, they can be a terrible pest. And this actually shows a, uh, a plant that was actually killed. This was a Schifflera, which had a bad infestation. It was actually killed by by the uh, citrus mealybug. So let's talk about controls. First of all, you could, if you, if it's possible, just use a soft toothbrush and scrape them off. Now that's not practical on some plants. You can't do that on ivies or hoya, which a lot of vines. But mm -hmm. on on a plant like Schifflera, you could actually use a toothbrush and scrape off as many as those insects as you can see. Then there are some sprays. Uh, if you apply the sprays, they have to be applied uh, about every week for about a month. So you get on about four applications, because if you don't do that, those mature scales and mealybugs will still produce young because you can't control those, those mature insects. And so they keep producing young. And if you just put, apply one spray, that won't do it. So be sure that you apply four sprays at weekly intervals and for about a month. Now you can use the bonide insecticide soap, and that comes as a 12 ounce ready to use, or bonide also makes a, uh, a material called bonide eight insect control house and garden. That, can, that also is, comes as a 12 ounce and ready to use. Then if it's practical, you could apply granules to the soil with one application and uh, that's a systemic chemical by Bonite again, and that's imidacloprid. And uh, if you apply that, you just apply it to the soil, work it in a little bit, and then 
when the uh, when you water the plant, then the uh, insecticide is dissolved and then it goes into the plant and it controls and it controls a large number of insects that are feeding on the plant. So you control uh, mealybugs, scale, white fly, aphids, anything like that. Then the bear also makes a product, and that's called Bear Two-in-One Insect Control Plus Fertilizer. And I brought in a uh, one of these packets that have the uh, uh, some of it, it comes as a uh, uh, granule, but then other cases, it comes as a tablet. And you can put the tablet in the, in the uh, just push it in the soil and then water it in. So that's okay. how to control it. But they can really be a terrible pest. I've lost a couple of houseplants to scale, mm -hmm. and it yeah. seems like you don't know it until it's, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah. You know, you don't find one or two, you find a clump. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. it's like, oh boy, now How what do we do? That? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did I miss oh, that? No. <laughs> All right, Kay, we are to you. Okay, well, um, I brought some garlic um, because it's still uh, early enough to plant it at, at this time. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time to plant it. You plant generally, garlic is a little bit confused from other plants because you plant it in the fall mm -hmm. and then you harvest it, it usually in July or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's, I've got two different varieties and this is a great big one. The clothes are really huge. And then we have a little smaller one. Um, and they're both nice because sometimes you don't want a ton of garlic, you just want a little bit. So I use the little ones. Um, and to plant them, you just break off, I can do this, you, you break <laughs> off a clove and you can leave the skin on it and you want to plant it. Um, this is kind of the stem end and this is the other end. Uh, you want this, um, the stem end down so you plant it up and down like this mm -hmm. and you want to plant them at least a a big one like this, like a good two inches or more. And I I work the soil in the row um, before I plant them, so it's nice and loose underneath. Um, <clears throat> and and then same way with this. Now spacing, I of course space these a lot bit mm -hmm. further apart. Mm -hmm. uh, then usually I space them about three three inches, three or four okay. inches, and just make a long row and cover it um, with the dirt. And then you want to mulch it. Um, I normally, I use straw to mulch it, okay. a good thick layer. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we had so many leaves, I tried leaves, and that worked really well, too. Okay. This year, for some reason, we don't have as many leaves as we did last <laughs> year. So um, you want to keep that uh, covered until, and they'll do, they actually just grow up, the shoots will grow up through the, um, mm -hmm. mulch. Mm -hmm. so, uh, now when is that window going to close of when you can get them into the well, ground? Well before the ground freezes. Okay. You know so you want to do it a little bit ahead of time so they get kind of a head start. I, I, the ones I planted, um, oh, I don't know, maybe a month ago, I were already up and growing. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. We've got a little bit of time left to get that garlic in if you would like to enjoy some in the summer, right? Yeah, Next you, summer? It, it's just opposite of everything. It, it is. I had to really <laughs> pause and think about and it for a second. And then when you do dig it, um, you want to let the skins dry on, on the stem. The stem will be pretty tall. That's what I remember seeing um, mm -hmm. the braids, mm -hmm. the garlic braids, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in a garage or something mm -hmm. like that when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were drying. Though. See, that's, sure. that's the stuff that you see when you're a kid and you, it really doesn't click. And then when you get older, it's like, Oh, that had a purpose. It yeah. didn't just look cool <laughs> hanging in the in the yeah. garage. So, <laughs> anywho, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. Yes. Okay, yeah. we are to the landscaper. So, Indeed. as we are ready to put our tools away, sadly, yeah, there's maintenance involved. Yeah, don't put them away, cruddy. I only have one caveat to what Kay was sharing about garlic, and that is, my name ends in a vowel. There's no such thing as too much garlic. Never. It's just not. So Never, never, <laughs> never. <laughs> so it is easier than you think to, uh, I think I brought my toolbox in, mm -hmm. to sharpen your tools. It's very, very satisfying job. Um, I just did these recently. Can you get a close-up on here? These 
these little hand pruners just go together with a with a, a bolt, okay? And the the spring just pulls off. There's two little two little nubs that it catches on. So take the bolt out, take the spring off. It'll come away in two pieces. The, the, so you have the nut and the bolt, and the nut is is on these is uh, self tightening. It's uh, locking that. So there's no groove or anything on the back of the on the on the head side of the bolt. If you do, I mean, I've got I got a pair of loppers here too, and these are uh, same same thing. I've used these so much that this is almost busted off, poor old lad. But um, <laughs> same idea. So you take them apart. It's easier. You don't have to take them apart, but it is easier if you do. So. For those of you who have not sharpened before, this is pretty simple, <laughs> but it's kind of odd at first when you think, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about sharpening. So you see this, there's a flat side. I'm going to need a close up here, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a flat side to this cutting blade, and then there's a beveled side to the cutting blade. And this, this edge here is what you're trying to sharpen, okay? So, when you sharpen, the beveled edge, you want to go like that. Like that. People instinctively want to go like that. That's not right. Get a flat file, and what you do is you, you use the beveled <laughs> edge. I thought I'm going to be wearing this water. Yeah. I should have probably Fine. just took this apart earlier, but okay. What you want to do is push the file into the beveled edge. Okay. Into the beveled edge. Can you edge. see that? You push the file into the beveled edge. And you go all the way from the bottom to the very tip. This is what sharpens your blade, not the other way. This is what gets you a good edge on that blade. Now, I'm not even looking at where I'm at, because I've done this a lot, you try to get the, get the file right on that beveled edge, and without even looking at what I'm doing, can you see, one more. <laughs> <laughs> can you see on here close, I don't know if you can see or not, mm -hmm. where this, there you go, the light's catching it. This little edge is shinier now, mm -hmm. because I've taken it off. Now this, this isn't that terribly dull, because I've been using them and I was, I was sharpening them, but um, do that and keep testing the edge once in a while. Sometimes they're absolutely horrible. Sometimes they're not too bad. But remember, push the blade into the file or the file into the blade, whatever is easiest for you. And you do this with your hand pruners and you do this with your loppers and you also do it with your shovel. Okay. Okay. Same thing. Could you just hold this for a minute? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Did I have a choice? No. Um, you can, I've, I usually do it like this, like on the top. But again, when you're using your file, you can, you can do it from the back as well. But I kind of like this. Mm -hmm. um, again. You push the file in uh, into the face of that cutting edge. It doesn't, it seems counterproductive, but trust me, mm -hmm. it isn't. I've been doing this a long time. So there's some little nibs and nabs and grabs and chunks out of there. But if you keep at it, um, you'll get them out. Okay. And I'm telling you what, once you sharpen a shovel or a spade and you use it, you'll kick yourself for not sharpening those later. Because man, oh man, does that make a difference. <laughs> I mean, you know, work smarter, not harder. There's plenty of hard work in the garden. That's right. Yeah. Let's so, not make the tools one of them. Yeah, make your tools help you out. That's okay. what you got. Grog make tool, you know. Okay. All right. All right. Jim, we're back to you. We've got some bush. Yeah, I thought samples. I'd bring in some uh, plants here that are have red berries or red fruits at this time of year. This plant here is called a mur, A M U R, honeysuckle. Sometimes it's referred to as bush honeysuckle. You don't want to have this on your property. 
it's it's pretty right now because of the red berries but the birds eat the red berries and then they dr distribute the berries in their droppings all over the place and it's very very invasive so if you have this get rid of this on your property another plant that's having red fruits on is burning bush and this is a very pretty beautiful red foliage that it has and has these fruits on it right now this too can be invasive now i i don't have a i have one large bush on my property and it doesn't seem to be invasive but other people have reported that it is invasive so you got to be careful about this one as well and then this last one is called spice bush this is a native these other two that i mentioned are are exotics but this is called spice bush and it's a native plant it has these bright red fruits on it these will fall in fact they're falling at the present time but it's rather a nice plant it tends to um, be somewhat invasive if you don't careful i mean it does it, it seems the suckers doesn't it not well it does a little bit suckers but the uh, seeds are distributed by animals and so you you do find quite a few of these plants coming up here and there but you can always get rid of those very easily but it's a pretty plant because it has these red, bright red fruits on it and a native species okay excellent um who did any of you grow potatoes this year no. Nobody grew potatoes? No, but I like them. I okay. have. <laughs> All right. Past. I have well, grown quick them in the question. past. I have um, <laughs> Noreen Novak, she sent in an email and mm -hmm. grew them in a sack um, mm -hmm. this year. And she wants to know if the smaller ones here on the cardboard can be used as seed potatoes um, to grow more. What well, are your thoughts there? if they have there? eyes, I yeah. would think you could use, you know, if they have yeah. eyes, you could use them. Whoa. Can you get yeah. Noreen to pick one of those up out of the picture so we can see if they have... So there we go. <laughs> okay, there are the little guys right a, there. So There's an eye right on that one in the middle. Yeah. So size doesn't really matter when it comes to these. You can just grow. No, if, if it's doesn't. got eyes, then... Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, that doesn't make any difference. It's, it's, it's the presence of the eye that's really important. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Noreen. So, yes, you can grow those. Um, when I was a kid, those were those were dog potatoes. Because we grew a lot of potatoes for a family of eight, and um, the teeny tiny ones we threw off in a five-gallon bucket, and we had several dogs, so if we'd run out of kibble, <laughs> mom would put those in a big crock pot, or in a big stock pot, and she'd cook them. She'd throw in some bacon grease, and dogs loved it. I bet they did. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> they did. <laughs> I bet they did. That's I a delicacy. Grandma's bacon cooking grease. tonight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's it actually so doesn't old. sound bad at all. No, she didn't put any onions. I'd eat it all the time. Heck yeah, I'd like to taste the bacon grease. Heck yeah. Let's see, uh, Margie Brewer has a question. She wants to know if you guys can um, suggest any annuals for next year, she's thinking ahead, um, that can be put in an area where there's concrete and it only gets direct sun in the afternoon. So near concrete and only afternoon sun. Sure, almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> pretty much in pots. Whatever you. She can kind of get away with whatever, huh? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm wondering. I wish she had given us the dimensions of the bed. I mean, are we talking about a strip a foot wide or a strip three feet wide? What Doesn't do we say. It, it Doesn't does not say. say. But we need a size here, so because everything doesn't get the same size. No. You know, I would go with. Uh, part shade to full sun plants because the afternoon sun is stronger and it's mm -hmm. hotter and you have the house reflecting heat and you have the concrete reflecting heat so and so the the bed however wide it is is going to be uh, pretty alkaline because of the leaching of the mm -hmm. concrete into the into the soil there and frequently when the house is built that's a good throw that junk in there area <laughs> yeah because construction workers are not typically avid gardeners so you know they, they got their job and we got ours so you might want to test the soil okay. just for fun it's easy get a t get a soil test kit do it at home you know put on a white coat and a, and a headlamp you know be the mad scientist it's really easy you just use some tap water and you get a little sample it's very fun um, okay I've done it on the show before so test your soil you may have to amend it uh, just to get the pH lower, but if it's like six and a half, seven, you're you're right in the zone. And anything, sedum, black-eyed susans, catmint, mm -hmm. uh, 
cone fly. Help me out. Take I mean, your pick. Yeah. Zinnias? What about zinnias? Yeah. 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 Annuals. Did she say perennials or anything? Annuals. She wanted annuals only. Yeah. Oh, say, so never mind that other stuff. I <laughs> but okay. yeah, um, almost any, almost any sun-loving annual mm -hmm. should do really well there. Okay. I would think. Um, off topic, but also timely, Jim, is there anything we can do to get the stink bugs away from the door? <laughs> million a, dollar question. Maybe a vacuum. Would be <laughs> best. I, you know. There's nothing that repels them. There's nothing they don't like. There's not a scent that yeah. they don't mint. No cinnamon. No nothing. No. Well, I mean, I I really don't know. Okay. I okay. have to confess. I Wait a minute. Know. Okay, so I've got another question for the master here. What are those little black moths? Yes. Oh, we oh. had those too. I've They're never seen everywhere. them before. Thank you. That's what are those? That's the green clover worm. Green adults, clover worm. Adults are the green clover worm. Mm -hmm. The uh, caterpillar will feed often on soybeans. So, mm -hmm. and other beans as well, but it's it's called a green clover worm. Well, that's they are the, copious this season. Yes, and they I've are. I've never They're seen green. them before. It's oh, the adult, not like this. It's the no. adult uh, of the green clover worm. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. Do they come in waves like this, or? Well, I. <laughs> they seem to be gone now. Yes. 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 Yeah. They, were intense they are in the fall about months, three weeks. just for about a period of about two weeks. And, uh, gotcha. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Good, good call. Okay. Because we're surrounded by corn this year, and there's no soybeans. <laughs> See, we had. Well, well I didn't it will feed were. on other plants as well. Oh, but, they must. Yeah. They oh, yeah. To death it does. This year, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. But but uh, soybean is its favorite. Oh, ah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we everybody's had got soybeans on the west and north of us. Oh, I bet you had them. Everywhere. Yeah. Blanketing. <laughs> they were. I, nice. Yeah, they, they were. The grass of their dust. <laughs> They were in yes. my car. I'm like, stop, get them yes, out. Yes, they yeah. were everywhere. Okay, we've got about five minutes left. You want to talk about tree wraps? Yes, I sure can. All right, take us home. If you're planting trees, <laughs> which I have done a few this year, and I still have some to do. All right, you can buy these. Uh, I think I got these at Menards. They come in a package that looks like this. They're a couple of bucks, okay? This is officially called Tree Master Spiral Tree Protector. Two okay. inches wide by 24 inches. Tall, okay, and you wrap this around the tree trunk when you plant a tree. This is rabbit defense, is what oh, this okay. is. But just because this is two inches wide does not mean you have to plant something that's two inches wide. My arm is considerably larger than two inches wide, and when you put it on your tree, mm -hmm. just pretend this is the ground. Okay, here's the top. All right, you just start it on and roll it around. Okay. Do you want to leave any space between no. the wrap and the tree? No space. We don't want to see any tree. No. Okay. Keep getting the get it close will... to each other, and especially when you're way down on the bottom on the ground, take this right down to the ground. Okay. So it's like that, and and it's expandable. It has vent holes in it, so that moisture doesn't build up on your tree. It fits closely enough so insects can't live in there. Okay. And it keeps the moisture from accumulating. <laughs> and you can see, if you keep doing this, that my arm is completely protected if my sleeve is the ground because no rabbits, rabbits can't. are That's getting right. in there. Here we go. No rabbits. It's flexible. If the trunk's a little crookedy, it doesn't matter. And it expands as the tree grows. So you put this on when it's a little fart, and then just leave it on. Leave it on for a couple of seasons. I've lost more dogwood and amelanchor and rose standards and hydrangea standards to a little bit of rabbit damage because they don't just take a bite. No. They, the they, they girdle the trees yes. and make you mad. Now, are there any certain trees that do need that more than others? No, Is it so they will they will munch put on them on everything. Okay. Just in case. Just this is preventative medicine case. here. This is this is HMO for the tree crowd. Okay. They're, uh, these are these are so invaluable. I've got to plant. I still have a lot of stuff in my yard to plant because I plant in other people's yards, and I I got a huge. Got to catch up on your own. Two rows, two rows standards, three dogwood trees. They're all going to be wearing this, and I will <clears> leave that on, ad infinitum. And it just the the once once a tree gets a caliper of about four or five inches, the rabbits won't chew on it anymore. But before then. Is it because it's softer? Is that? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The bark gets tougher and they don't want to do it. And now then on, on roses, you're SOL. You better leave those things on until death takes them because 
But it won't be rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be the rabbits. You will win the war against I, the rabbits. Yeah, Haas and Pfeffer. Haas <clears throat> and Pfeffer, yeah. Okay. Well, guys, we're, we're, we've got about a minute left. We're out of time. So thank you so much for coming in. We learned a lot today. And thank you so much for joining us. If you've got questions for our panelists, please send them in to yourgarden at gmail.com. Or you can look us up on Facebook. Just search for Mid-American Gardener. And that is it for us on this edition. And we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Good night.